Welcome to History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor, Greg Jackson, and I'd like to tell you a story. It's January 3rd, 1777, and General Washington's advanced guard has stumbled upon two regiments of redcoats at Princeton, New Jersey. The fighting turns fierce as the methodical, well-trained British regulars push the Americans back. The Patriots fight valiantly, but continue to lose men. The British even manage to bayonet George's dear friend and fellow Virginian, General Hugh Mercer. They pierce him seven times. The fight isn't looking good for the Americans. Not until George arrives, that is. He yells out to the men, Parade with us, my brave fellows. There is but a handful of the enemy, and we will have them directly. George rides out, lining the men up himself. The sight is majestic. The massive Virginian gallops upon a large white horse as he yells orders and moves across the lines. With his men prepared, George stays right out front, right between two lines of men who mean to kill each other, one of which means to kill him. Fire! George sits in the middle of a crossfire as countless lead balls explode from muskets at close range with deadly intent. Colonel Richard Fitzgerald's heart sinks. He can't bear to look. He pulls his hat down over his face for fear of watching his general die. And given his position on the battlefield, what hope could George have? Musket balls find their marks as men on both sides collapse, dead or wounded. Not a single one so much as grazes the overexposed general. And he's had a few good moments in this war. Well, okay, I really mean Boston and Trenton. But this is an important first. George's men have finally made a British line break. It's a fine fox chase, my boys! George hollers as he spurs his horse and takes off in pursuit. As George gives chase, artillery captain Alexander Hamilton fires on British troops taking cover in Princeton College's Nassau Hall. Now this is unsubstantiated, but it's alleged that one of Alexander's cannons rips through a portrait of King George II. We'll never know for sure if that's true, but the young captain's barrage on the same school that once accepted him but then denied his proposed accelerated study does lead the hiding redcoats to surrender. Princeton proves a success. It's not quite as clean as the victory at Trenton just over a week ago, where George took nearly a thousand captives and only saw two Americans die, both of whom froze to death on Christmas night. Here at Princeton, over 20 Americans lay dead, and poor old General Mercer will languish for nine days before death relieves his suffering from the multiple bayonet piercings. Nonetheless, it's a solid victory, including the taking of another two or three hundred prisoners of war. Between his December 26th victory at Trenton, and now this victory at Princeton, George has truly given new hope to patriots across the colonies and restored his reputation so badly damaged by his losses in New York last year. He's also shown the British that if they are going to have a victory in America, it won't come as easily as they thought. Yeah, poor General Cornwallis isn't going to get to visit his wife back in England this winter after all. As George and his men head to the village of Morristown, New Jersey, to wait out the rest of the winter, it looks like he can breathe a little easier. And with that, we've officially finished the campaign of 1776. Ready for 1777? Today we're going to cover just about everything you need to know about the year. To that end, I'm going to tell you the story of Johnny Burgoyne's Canadian-launched failed invasion of upstate New York, called the Saratoga Campaign. Lasting from June through October, Saratoga involves some big names and egos. Philip Schuyler, Horatio Gates, and the notorious Benedict Arnold. From there, we'll go hang out with Ben Franklin in Paris because France is officially allying with America. But then we'll need to turn back the clock. George Washington's going the rounds with General Howe down in Pennsylvania at the same time as the Saratoga campaign, and he's not having much luck. Once again, scrutiny comes George's way. Patriots, including congressmen, are wondering if America wouldn't be better off with a different commander-in-chief. We'll leave George dealing with this love loss amid the misery of Valley Forge. Ready? 
in the spirit of the French influence on this episode. On y va? John Burgoyne is a gambler, a playwright, handsome, vain. John is often the life of high society parties. He's eloped with the Earl of Derby's daughter, and the ladies say he's rather talented in the bedroom. But don't let these playboy characteristics throw you. He's also a British general who served with distinction in Portugal during the Seven Years' War. And he's done his part for king and country fighting against the Patriots in Boston and New York. I know. This guy sounds like an 18th century version of the Dos Equis' most interesting man in the world. In fact, John Burgoyne's interesting lifestyle has earned him a nickname, Gentleman Johnny. And that's exactly how I will refer to him throughout this entire episode. On leave during the winter of 1776 to 1777, Gentleman Johnny is in London presenting a plan to end the American Rebellion. And he doesn't mind throwing his superior, who's back in Canada, the governor of Quebec and commander of Canadian forces, Guy Carleton, under the bus in the process to secure the leadership role. Gentleman Johnny's ambitious, and he's looking out for himself. His plan involves three military forces, and it goes like this. He will lead one army of some 8,000 from Canada down into New York via Lake Champlain and the upper part of the Hudson River. If you don't know the area, these bodies of water make the boundary between the state of New York and the northern half of Vermont. After that, the Hudson runs solidly down eastern New York. This will be Johnny's path. As he descends down the Empire State, a second smaller force led by Lieutenant Colonel St. Ledger will cut eastward across upstate New York via the Mohawk River. St. Ledger's forces will then join his on the Hudson River, likely near Albany, New York. Now, the third military's involvement is a bit shakier. To quote, The next measure must depend on those taken by the enemy, the written plan explains. Fair enough, gentlemen Johnny, fair enough. It is hard to say what things will look like on the ground months down the road. Nonetheless, Gentleman Johnny suggests that he will make a junction with a third military force from Britain's commander-in-chief in North America, General William Howe. Thus, all three forces, his descending from Canada, St. Ledger's following the Mohawk River, and Howe's ascending the Hudson, will hook up likely near Albany. Doing so, they'll isolate rebellious New England from the other colonies. Divide and conquer. Both King George and the current Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Germain, dig it. The plan, today called the Saratoga Campaign, gets approved. There's just one problem. Germain also approves Howe's summer plan to take Philadelphia. Okay, look, this is an issue historians argue over. So I'm going to tell you outright, we don't know exactly what everyone is thinking here. Clearly, Howe can't be in two places at once. It's likely that Colonial Secretary Germain figures Howe can sack Philly early enough in the summer to then swing up north and participate in Gentleman Johnny's plan. But, and I want to stress this, Germain never orders General Howe to participate. Howe is not obligated to head north. We're going to follow Gentleman Johnny to Canada now, but as the episode rolls on, just keep this miscommunication with General Howe in mind. Gentleman Johnny sails out of London on the HMS Apollo and arrives in Quebec on May 6, 1777. He takes control of a diverse force. First, he's got 6,700 regulars, 3,000 of whom are German mercenaries. He also has about 500 Iroquois Indian allies, and another 650 Canadian and Loyalist troops. He also has 138 pieces of artillery. Oh, and let's not forget the wives and children of officers. This motley crew sets out from Montreal. They hook up with the British fleet on Lake Champlain and launch an amphibious invasion of upstate New York in late June. Gentleman Johnny's first target is Fort Ticonderoga. You might remember it. I mentioned it briefly in episode 6 when Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold's men took the fort from the British in May 1775. 
This fort is now the main point of defense against British Canada, and it falls under the command of General Philip Schuyler. Ah, Philip Schuyler. I know I've mentioned him before, but let's bond for a minute with the future father-in-law of Alexander Hamilton and current commander of the American Northern Department. You need to know that Philip, born and bred in New York, descends from old Dutch colonial blood. The Schuylers go back to the 1600s, when New York City was still New Amsterdam. So he's a faithful patriot, but he's also a well-heeled elite. And unlike George Washington, he lacks the ability to appeal to the more average, egalitarian-oriented New England farmers who make up most of his forces. Further, New England's congressmen don't care for Philip. What can I say? The rivalry between Boston and New York has been around longer than the Red Sox and the Yankees. So the politicking is going to be thick here. And in that spirit, let's also introduce another slightly, but not yet super familiar name, Horatio Gates. Can we just pause and ask why people aren't naming their kids Horatio more frequently? That's the name of a champion. It commands attention. Anyhow, Horatio is a general under the command of Philip Schuyler. A crucial difference between them, though, is that New Englanders like Horatio. Born in Britain and an ex-British soldier, he now calls Virginia home. He's also ambitious. And would really love it if Congress would give him command of the forces in the North. So, you can see where he might be a problem for Philip Schuyler, right? Let's keep this in mind, as... Gentleman Johnny moves in on Fort Ticonderoga. He takes the fort easily. There's a hill nearby called Mount Defiance, and if the British get their artillery on it, this fort is screwed. Fort Ticonderoga's commander, General Arthur St. Clair, hopes Gentleman Johnny is stupid enough to go for a frontal assault on the fort. He isn't. On July 5th, Gentleman Johnny gets his guns up on Mount Defiance, and Arthur knows his roughly 2,000-strong American force will get wiped out if he tries to hold on to the fort. So, wisely, he saves his men's lives by bailing on Fort Ticonderoga that night and leading them further south to Fort Edward. And there, they meet up with the northern commander, General Philip Schuyler, on July 12th. The fall of Ticonderoga is seen by the British as a serious game changer. In fact, King George seems to think this could be the end of the rebellion. I have beat them! I have beat the Americans! He proudly announces to his wife, Queen Charlotte, upon hearing the news. Eh, sorry, Georgie. It really sucks for the Americans, no doubt, but the war is far from over. In fact, Things are about to go south for Gentleman Johnny, and although this is the direction he's taking his army, I don't mean that literally. This is the beginning of his failure. As he continues his pursuit of the American army, he makes a huge mistake at Skeensboro. There, he lets a local loyalist convince him to continue his southward trek by land rather than using the river systems. Johnny, you idiot. Yes, this guy's a Tory, a loyalist, but he's also into real estate, and I'm sure he doesn't mind the military building a major road for free. Because of this not sage advice, Gentleman Johnny's army now exchanges the smoother passage of traveling on boats for hacking through marsh and thick forests of sycamores and evergreens. Beyond the natural terrain, they also have to deal with sabotage. General Philip Schuyler's men, who know the land, are chopping down massive trees to obstruct the British Army's path. Can you imagine how draining this would be? Walking through dirt and mud, hauling supplies for an army of around 7,000, only to find a massive tree in front of you that has to be chopped up and dragged out of the way? As a result of these tactics, it takes Gentleman Johnny's army 24 days to cover 23 measly miles. It's July 30th by the time he reaches Fort Edward and find he has to just keep going south in pursuit of the Americans. Meanwhile, he's burning through supplies quickly. But low supplies aren't Gentleman Johnny's only problem. To make matters worse, his Indian allies are not working out. It's about this same time that one of the 500 Indians in his army, believed to be a guy named Wyandotte Panther, murders a colonial woman, Jenny McRae. He shoots her, scalps her, 
and takes her clothes, leaving her dead body naked. Gentleman Johnny condemns the act, but he doesn't dare take action against Wyandotte for fear that his whole army of 500 Indians will bail on him. Oh, does this piss off the colonial population. By the way, she was actually a loyalist, but that doesn't matter. Her violent death and Gentleman Johnny's choice not to punish it makes for great patriot propaganda. Beyond this singular act of murder, other Indian allies are also going to make sure that the smaller British army that's supposed to rendezvous with Gentleman Johnny's near Albany, New York, never make it. You remember that part of the plan, right? In case you don't, while Johnny leads the main army south, Colonel St. Ledger leads a smaller army of 1,800 men, mostly loyalists and Indians, eastward through New York's Mohawk Valley to meet him. But that isn't happening because of a brilliant strategic move made by General Benedict Arnold and his men that will cause the Indians to desert. See, while heading out to deal with the colonel's army of loyalists and Indians in the month of August, Arnold's men capture the slightly mentally unstable and suspected loyalist spy, Hanyo Schuyler. Now, this would not be terribly significant, except that Han's mental instability causes him to ramble, and many local Indians consider his ramblings to be prophetic. Benedict and his officers decide to use Han's status as a prophet to their advantage. Let me read you some of the story from the journal of Continental Army Dr. James Thatcher. To quote, Schuyler should be liberated and his estate secured to him on the condition that he would return to the enemy and make such exaggerated report of General Arnold's forces as to alarm and put them to flight. Several friend Indians being present, one of their headmen advised that Schuyler's coat should be shot through in two or three places to add credibility to his story. Matters being thus adjusted, the imposter proceeded directly to the Indian camp. This stratagem was successful. The Indians instantly determined to quit their ground. St. Ledger, finding himself deserted by his Indians to the number of seven or eight hundred, deemed his situation so hazardous that he decamped in the greatest hurry and confusion, leaving his tents with most of his artillery and stores in the field. Yep, this mass Indian desertion just made Gentleman Johnny's second army collapse. Between this and the Jenny McRae murder, American Indians, who are found on both sides of the war, just like the colonists, profoundly impact the Saratoga campaign in favor of the Patriots. Now that St. Ledger's army is out of the picture, I want to return to Gentleman Johnny and his dwindling supplies, but we have one more stop. Time to talk American egos and politicking. Philip Schuyler has succeeded in harassing and slowing Gentleman Johnny's march. He sent General Benedict Arnold to deal with St. Ledger. And how is he rewarded? With a demotion. Congress blames him for the loss of Fort Ticonderoga, despite the fact that he did not have enough men to man the fort, and names Horatio Gates the new commander of the Northern Department in August. Philip is certain this move is personal. He writes his friend, Governor Morris. Yes, this is the guy's first name. Really, Governor, that's not a title. Anyhow, he writes Governor to complain in a letter shortly after this, quote, My crime consists in not being a New England man in principle, and unless they alter theirs, I hope I never shall be. General Gates is their idol because he is at their direction. Close quote. And lest we think that it's just a coincidence that New England's delegates prefer Horatio Gates, let me add that Horatio is also actively campaigning to take Philip's place. See what I mean about egos? Horatio's looking out for number one. What can I say? Gentleman Johnny isn't the only one in this episode who's willing to throw his superior under the bus. But enough about the role of Indians, the demise of Colonel St. Ledger's small army, and the substantive end of Philip Schuyler's military career. Let's get back to Gentleman Johnny's low on supplies army. Gentleman Johnny needs to offset some of his dwindling supplies. He hopes to do so by sending Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Baum with 800 men to raid the town of Bennington, Vermont. The German colonel is to take the food and horses needed for the whole army to continue south. Now, why Johnny thought sending 
a non-English speaking commander into an area replete with patriots and loyalists is beyond me. This could call for some delicate communication with civilians, but I guess the playwright general didn't think about the power of language. Unfortunately for this raiding party, John Stark is nearby. You remember John? We met the New Hampshire commander at the Battle of Bunker Hill in Episode 7. Well, in the days it takes Colonel Baum and his men to march to Bennington, John's preparing for them, and he's determined to stop them. On the morning of August 16th, the day of the battle, he tells his men something to the effect of, quote, Tonight our flag floats over yonder hill or Molly Stark sleeps a widow. Thankfully, his solid victory won't make his wife a widow tonight. In a move as deceitfully clever as Benedict Arnold's false prophet, John has his men attach the white paper badge that loyalist militia wear to their hats. As they march out toward non-English speaking Colonel Baum, the poor Germans think John's men are allies. Baum's loyalists and Indian allies both cut and run. Baum receives reinforcements, but John Stark crushes them as well. In the end, the New Hampshire general reports, quote, We recovered four pieces of brass cannon, some hundred stands of arms, eight brass barrels, drums, several Hessian swords, about 700 prisoners, 207 dead on the spot. Damn, that's a rough day for the British. Okay, just to review how screwed Gentleman Johnny is at this point. St. Ledger's small army won't be meeting up with him in Albany. He just lost nearly another 1,000 men at Bennington. His supplies are still getting lower. Oh, and another fun fact, Patriot Major General Benjamin Lincoln cuts off the communication line between his main army, those he left at Fort Ticonderoga, and Canada. Though to be fair, contact with Canada wouldn't do much good anyway. That not-so-brilliant colonial secretary back in London, Lord Germain, made the bureaucratic move to put a freeze on any Canadian troops moving south. This is terrible for Gentleman Johnny. But at least now you know that administrators making poor decisions without knowing all the facts is a centuries-old tradition. Let's contrast this hot mess with our new commander of the Northern Department, Horatio Gates. He's having the exact opposite experience. He has local militia helping. And even though George Washington's dealing with his own problems down in Pennsylvania, he sacrifices by sending some of his troops to bolster Horatio. Among those sent north are Colonel Daniel Morgan and his frontier riflemen. They are legendary for their sniping skills. Given this situation, Johnny, who is now in the vicinity of Saratoga, New York, hence the name of this military campaign, doesn't stand a chance. It's not easy packing an entire campaign into half an episode, so I won't give the details of the first battle in Saratoga, which takes place on September 19th at Freeman's Farm. There's really only one thing you need to know here. It creates a beef between General Horatio Gates and Benedict Arnold. See, Horatio can be a cautious general. On the other hand, Benedict can be pretty aggressive. As the commander, Horatio kind of clips Benedict's ability to go full throttle. And truth be told, if Benedict had more support, it's possible he would have ended Gentleman Johnny then and there. Well, Horatio, who's looking out for himself as we've already seen, sends a report to Congress about the battle and totally leaves Benedict's bravery and accomplishments out. Just doesn't mention him. Now, side note, if you're asking yourself, Hey, shouldn't Horatio be sending his reports to the Commander-in-Chief General Washington rather than directly to Congress? Let me tell you, you're right. So there's evidence that Horatio is also angling to maybe bump George just like he did Philip Schuyler. But we'll get to that later. Right now, the important thing is Arnold's pissed. Things escalate between the two egocentric men quickly. They have a shouting match or as Colonel Henry Livingston puts it, quote, matters were altercated in a very high strain, close quote. That's 18th century for, well, that escalated quickly. In the end, Horatio takes Arnold's command away. Ouch. And lest there be any doubt still in your mind about the bravery or performance of the future traitor, Benedict Arnold, let's quote Colonel Livingston a bit more. 
All of this comes from a letter he sends to the former Northern commander, Philip Schuyler. To quote him, General Arnold is the life and soul of the troops. Believe me, sir, to him and to him alone is due the honor of our late victory. He has pocketed many insults for the sake of his country, which a man of less pride would have resigned. I'll back that up further with Captain Wakefield's thoughts on Benedict at the Battle of Freeman's Farm. To quote him, Nothing could exceed the bravery of Arnold on this day. He seemed the very genius of war. Close quote. Today, if you go to Schuylerville, New York, you can visit the Saratoga Monument. Like the memorial of other battles we've previously discussed, there's an obelisk. This one's quite large, and each of its four sides is dedicated to the memory of one of the four main American commanders in this campaign. One has a niche with a statue of Philip Schuyler. Another has a niche with a statue of Horatio Gates. The third, a niche with a statue of the rifleman Colonel Daniel Morgan. The fourth has a niche too, but it's empty. No statue honors the traitor, Benedict Arnold. I like this monument. It takes on the challenging task of recognizing Benedict's crucial contributions to the American Revolution, to this campaign, while not honoring America's most famous traitor. By no means am I calling Benedict's betrayal justified. Let's be clear on that. I do hope, though, that you're coming to have a more nuanced, complex, human view of the man as you gain greater context. But enough about Benedict. We need to finish this campaign. As the days draw on, Gentleman Johnny hopes against hope that either General Clinton or General Howe can save him. Clinton, who's holding down the fort in New York City, makes a legit effort to help, but he can't get troops to Gentleman Johnny. As for Howe, well, remember at the start of this episode, I told you to keep in mind the miscommunication between him and Lord Germain. Here's where that problem manifests itself. Howe isn't coming. He's only days away from capturing Philadelphia at this same time, as you'll see later in this episode. So nearly out of food, Gentleman Johnny makes a last-ditch effort. He should retreat, and let me add that his most senior officers are pleading with him to do so, but Johnny's ego will have none of that. He didn't throw people under the bus to lose. On October 7th, he seals his entire army's fate. The battle is never in his favor. To give you a point of reference, Horatio has about 11,000 men at this point, and Johnny's down to some 5,000. But you know who really changes the gear on this battle? Again, Benedict Arnold. Despite having been stripped of command, it seems he can't help but charge out onto the battlefield. Benedict leads a frontal assault against a serious fortification called a redoubt. He suffers a nasty leg injury that will lay him up for months, but his move is the nail in the coffin for the Saratoga campaign. Gentleman Johnny has failed to divide and break the rebellion. He signs the official surrender 10 days after this lost battle on October 17, 1777, and goes back to England without the glory he hoped for and never to hold a military command again. His whole friggin' army is imprisoned in Massachusetts and Virginia. If only Johnny had some humility. Well, according to Horatio, all of England needs humility. The American North commander writes to his wife after the surrender, quote, If old England is not by this lesson taught humility, then she is an obstinate old slut bent upon her ruin. I cannot understate the importance of the capture of Gentleman Johnny's army. This is huge. This is what gets France to join the war. See, the French had already been providing some secret aid to the Patriots since May 1776, and this has been essential. But understandably, France doesn't want to get into an expensive war unless it really looks like the Americans have a real chance. As you know, to this point, the best George and his crew have managed to do is give some Hessians the worst Christmas ever at Trenton, New Jersey. But now... Well, the defeat of Gentleman Johnny in the Saratoga campaign shows that these scrappy rebels might have a chance. So hell yeah, France is ready to ante up. But look, just to be clear on motives, 
King Louis XVI isn't helping out of the goodness of his heart because he loves Republican government. Believe me, he's going to have his own headaches over representative government in the 1790s. Oh, please tell me you got that joke. Okay, that was dad joke material. I apologize. Back to Louis XVI's motivations. He's helping because the British crown is his nemesis. And more pointedly, he's helping because the British threw France out of North America after the, I don't even have to say it, nine episodes in, do I? You know, after the Seven Years' War. So Louis's motive to help is less because he agrees with the colony's philosophical assertions and more along the lines of a jealous ex. He's basically saying, look, Britain, if I can't have America, you can't have America. Let's say it in French. Ben voyons! Et compétent, si moi je peux pas avoir l'Amérique du Nord, toi aussi tu peux pas. And so, largely due to the outcome of the Saratoga campaign, the French government decides gambling on the Americans winning is better than not. But you haven't heard anything yet. You've got to check out the terms of the not one, but two treaties made between France and the United States. Oh, yes, that is the term being used. On February 6th, 1778. One of them, the Treaty of Amity and Commerce, is financial and just hooks the Americans up with incredible trade deals. The next one, the Treaty of Alliance, is everything America could ever want and more. Let me just quote Article 2 for you. The essential and direct end of the present defensive alliance is to maintain effectually the liberty, sovereignty, and independence absolute and unlimited of the said United States. Um, congrats, France. You just became the first major country to recognize the United States. But the love doesn't stop there. In Article 8, France agrees to fight, quote, until the independence of the United States shall have been formally and tacitly assured, close quote. Now, the flip side of that is the Americans can't make peace with the British unless France is cool with it too. But that's a deal. And the cherry on top? France renounces all territorial claims to North America. So when it's treaty time at the end of the war, France won't try to take a thing. That means this jealous ex has, you know, moved on. It's okay not getting the relationship back as long as it can get revenge. And who's the main American in Paris sorting out this treaty with France's foreign minister, Comte de Vergen? It's Dr. Benjamin Franklin. At 70 years old, the Philadelphian is showing Paris that age really is just a number. He's been there since December 1776, working his magic. You might say he puts on a show. Let me put it this way. Have you ever purposely played into a stereotype you know someone or some group holds about you to accomplish a goal? If you have, then you've pulled a Benjamin Franklin. He plays the romanticized American the Parisians want. He purposely wears plain clothes and ditches the wig for a fur cap to create that rugged frontiersman look. Atta boy, Ben. Meanwhile, the British government is floored with Ben's treaties, and it's scared. British leaders know that war with France is a total game changer. In fact, Britain's prime minister, still Lord North, makes another overture for peace, offering everything the Americans ever wanted minus independence. That offer would have settled things back in 1775. But now, with French aid, Lord North's a day late and a dollar short. A pound short? And I'll tell you, though the war will drag on for another six years, this is a turning point in the entire war. Gentleman Johnny's failure and its domino effect on France entering the war is really a big deal. Okay, I think we've done justice to the Saratoga campaign and its impact. But it's not like that's the only thing going down in 1777. George Washington's been having a rough go dancing around Pennsylvania with General Howe, and people are doubting him as he settles in for a crappy winter at Valley Forge. So let's go get the details on what George was doing when the Saratoga campaign took place. You ready? You know what we need to do. Rewind. When we left George, he had just beat the British at Princeton and made Winter's Camp at Morristown, New Jersey. During these early cold months of 1777, his army shrinks. Enlistments expire. Some of the men who signed on after the Battle of Trenton only agreed to a few more weeks. Others desert. The greatest of American traditions in the American Revolutionary War. Smallpox strikes as well. 
George staves off the deadly disease in part by using this new medical practice in which healthy people are purposely infected so they develop immunity with a milder form of the illness. It's called vaccination. Come March, George's Continental Army is down to a mere 3,000 or so. And George is also frustrating Congress. See, back in December, when things were at their worst, Congress gave him essentially dictatorial powers with the condition that it would end in six months. They did this with the thought that George could then commandeer whatever he needs from local farmers. Now, George certainly uses this power to get help for wounded soldiers, and he does make some civilians accept the poorly valued continental currency in order to buy much-needed supplies. But he does this sparingly. Instead, he's using his power more frequently to issue pardons. Most New Jerseyans who took the oath of loyalty to King George when General Howe occupied the area last year are forgiven if they will simply take a new loyalty oath to the United States. And even those who refuse to do so are not punished. They are simply escorted to British lines. His forgiveness upsets two groups. First, of course, are the radicals, who want blood and vengeance. See, that's just not how the general rolls. He's all about forgiveness. And of course, that's actually a good policy in the long run. It makes the patriots look like the good guys compared to the Redcoats, who, despite General Howe's best attempts to stop it, still did their fair share of raping and plundering. The second group, and this is especially the case for members of Congress, are upset at the oath being to the United States. There is no United States, they counter. We are sovereign states in an alliance. It would be like someone today taking a loyalty oath to NATO or the European Union. George is also creating military units that aren't attached to a specific state. So for many state-minded reps in Congress, George's actions here are troubling. But beyond the sickness, desertion, and angry men in Congress, how about we point out that on March 1st, Alexander Hamilton gets promoted from captain to lieutenant colonel as George's new aide-de-camp. He's joining George's military family, which is the term George uses for his closest advisors and generals. In fact, George and Alexander are going to play an enormous role in each other's lives. Alex will become the heir to George's Moses. The young West Indian immigrant's talent with words means he ends up writing many of George's letters to officers and to Congress. And I don't mean dictated letters. George lets Alexander figure out how to say it because he knows this youth does it better anyway. And while I'm talking about George's expanding military family, let me introduce you to his favorite Frenchman, the Marquis de Lafayette. Arriving in America with a letter of recommendation from Benjamin Franklin, Congress commissions 19-year-old Lafayette an honorary general on July 31st, 1777. Now, there are a lot of French officers showing up in America at this point, but he's different. He doesn't condescend to the Americans, which is something all Europeans tend to do at this point. Lafayette also works aggressively to learn English and becomes quite fluent fast. About a year after they meet, George will write to his friend, Governor Morris, quote, I do most devoutly wish that we had not a single foreigner among us, except the Marquis de Lafayette, who acts upon very different principles from that which govern the rest. Lafayette's commission occurred just after General Howe decided to start playing games with George. Yes, come late June, the military season of 1777, if you will, is afoot. First comes a series of fairly odd troop movements for a month. Even some of General Howe's officers are confused as to what he's trying to do. Remember, Howe's ultimate goal is Philly, but it might be that he's hoping to first draw George out for a fight. If so, it doesn't work. It just keeps George, who doesn't know Howe's intentions, wondering. Maybe Howe's going to go north to help Gentleman Johnny, who's just starting the Saratoga campaign at this point. Or will he move on Philadelphia? Or maybe he'll take the fight to the south. Meanwhile, George's spies are busy trying to figure it out. Well, come July, General Howe loads his 18,000-man army into a fleet of some 260 ships at New York and disappears. Remember, this is 1777. No GPS, no satellites, no Google Maps. So yes, over 260 ships can simply disappear. Is this a trap? Is Howe trying to make George think he's heading south only to double back to New York? He doesn't know. 
on July 31st, word comes to George that the fleet is at Delaware Bay. But then the fleet disappears again. What is Howe up to? The fleet finally materializes again three weeks later in late August to land at the town called Head of Elk. Today it's Elkton in Northern Maryland. Finally, after months of guessing, George knows where Howe is and can respond accordingly. A quick note here. These two months at sea are part of why General Howe can't help Gentleman Johnny when trouble starts brewing for him in upstate New York. There's a lot of people involved in the miscommunication here, and I don't want us to get bogged down, but suffice it to say that a number of letters are sent between Howe and other British leaders in Canada and London over the summer. When taken together, they show that Howe did not realize he would potentially be screwing over Gentleman Johnny by, one, taking his sweet time to move on Philly, and two, moving his troops by sea, effectively taking him out of the picture for two months. But once again, let's be clear. Colonial Secretary Lord Germain had approved Howe's attack on Philly. Hands down, this whole thing is the biggest British miscommunication of 1777, if not the whole friggin' war. Perhaps another indicator of Howe not realizing he's needed and wanted up north as desperately as he is is how slowly he moves. He doesn't seem to give a damn about getting to Philly quickly. Not only does he waste these two months at sea, but when he lands in Maryland, he's 57 miles away from the colonial capital. But having done so, he and George's armies finally come to a head in southeastern Pennsylvania. This is the September 11th Battle of Brandywine, and it's another loss for George. He has bad intel for the battle, And as a result, General Howe outflanks him just like he did last year in Brooklyn. What can I say? Everyone has their strengths. Howe knows how to flank. George knows how to sneak around in the dead of night. To be fair, George's still ill-trained, high-turnover army does do better. Solid rear-guard action allows most of the army to retreat successfully. In the end, though, Patriots suffer some 1,300 casualties, while British losses are about half of that. The battle also opens the path for Howe's men to take Philadelphia. This isn't really an in-depth on battles episode, but I do want to draw attention to how young Lafayette demonstrates his value at Brandywine. When the American line starts to break, he jumps off his horse and tries to rally the men. Lafayette orders them to fix bayonets and literally shoves those who fall out of line back into place. Amid all this, he gets shot in the left calf. James Monroe, now a captain, promoted by George Washington after taking a bullet at Trenton, helps him. The youthful future U.S. president and Frenchman will go on to become good friends. At the hospital, George Washington tells the doctors to attend to Lafayette, quote, as if he were my son, close quote. Overall, I would say the injury proves a blessing in disguise. It gives Lafayette serious street cred with the Patriots. Following Brandywine, the two armies dance around each other again for the most part. There is one incident worth mentioning, though. The Battle of Paoli, also known as the Paoli Massacre. George isn't at this one. The Patriots here are under the leadership of General Anthony Wayne, and their orders are to keep a closer eye on the British. On the night of September 20th, British Major General James Gray sneaks up on the sleeping Americans under the command of General Wayne. He's had his men remove the flint from their guns so no one can accidentally fire. Arriving at the American camp around 12 midnight or 1 a.m., the Redcoats proceed to bayonet the sleeping Patriots by the light of their own campfires. Many of these Americans never make it out of their beds. They just soak, dead, in their own blood. British Major John Andre tells us they, quote, stabbed great numbers. Near 200 must have been killed. A great number wounded. 71 prisoners. Close quote. British casualties are less than 10. George has failed to prevent General Howe from taking Philadelphia. Within a week of Paoli, triumphant redcoats march into the colonial capital on September 26th, 1777. The British capture of Philadelphia isn't as big of a deal as it might seem. General Howe hoped this would be a big psychological blow, but let's remember what's happening up in New York at the same time. 
Horatio Gates and his crew have Gentleman Johnny's army against the ropes. Further, George is not out for the count. His army is still together. Sure, Congress is inconvenienced by having to pack it up and bail on Philly. Eventually, they'll end up in York, Philadelphia, to wait it out. The greatest damage done by this occupation isn't to the Patriot cause. It's to George's reputation. The commander-in-chief is looking the fool here compared to his subordinate Horatio's success up north. So George could really use a victory at this point, and it appears Howe has given him the opportunity to score one. Lacking control of the Delaware River after taking Philadelphia, General Howe has to set up a camp for 9,000 or so of his men just a few miles north of the city, at Germantown. George draws on Roman history for inspiration, the 216 BC Battle of Cannae to be specific, and comes up with a plan. It requires four separate columns, all taking different paths, to move in on the British simultaneously and surround them. They will march through the night and attack Howe's unsuspecting army at 5 a.m. If it all goes according to plan, this will go down like the Battle of Trenton, except less ice and an even better outcome. If successful, George might capture General Howe, and that could mean the end of the war here and now. George's separate columns move out in the dark of night on October 3rd. A thick fog makes it hard to see, but come 5 a.m., his men are in place. General Sullivan's men attack first. True to American form, his soldiers lack the discipline to follow orders perfectly. But the surprised British fall back anyhow. Things are good. George is elated. But then events take a sharp turn for the worse. Amid the thick fog, one confused American general, Adam Stephen, led his men to attack another group of American soldiers. While other errors occurred in the battle, this friendly fire proves especially damaging. Oh, I should also mention that this general, he's drunk. And I don't mean buzzed, I mean wasted, hammered. I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn this is going to be the end of Adam Stevens' military career. And it's going to make sure that Germantown proves yet another loss for George. I'm going to tell you how this loss impacts George, But will you forgive me a cool little anecdote about the general that takes place shortly after the battle? George returns Howe's lost pet. I'm serious. I'll read you the letter sent to Howe with the dog on October 6, 1777. Quote, General Washington's compliments to General Howe. He does himself the pleasure to return him a dog, which accidentally fell into his hands, and by the inscription on the collar appeared to belong to General Howe. Seriously, dude tries to kill you, but returns your lost dog three days later. If that's not the epitome of soldier and gentleman, well, I don't know what is. Okay, anecdote done. Back to how Germantown impacts George. It's a mixed bag. On the plus side, most of his men fought well. The battle actually serves as a confidence boost for the army as they realize they can hold their own against Howe's main force. In fact, Howe comes away from the battle more impressed with, and scared of, George. France's foreign minister, Vergen, who, to remind you about timeline, will sign treaties with Ben Franklin in just a few months, is impressed with George's ragtag army as well. He recognizes that raising a military, from scratch, that can stand against the well-trained British within a mere year is a serious accomplishment. Ready for the downside? That whole not-bad-given-your-conditions perspective is not the way some congressional and military leaders see it. All they see is George losing. Again. Just like he did in New York. And New Jersey. And remember what I just said about George looking the fool while Horatio looks the hero? This is only all the more true as October moves on and Horatio feeds on the glory for capturing Gentleman Johnny's entire army. Never mind that the success is arguably more due to Benedict Arnold, or that George had sent Horatio reinforcements this summer at his own expense. Horatio looks good, George looks bad. You know how I sometimes remind you that the Founding Fathers don't agree on everything? This is one of those moments. Some congressmen question if George is still the right guy to have in command. These include American heroes, like the guy who introduced the resolution for American independence back in 1776, Richard Henry Lee. 
the most radical independence agitator of them all, Samuel Adams, and even his cousin who first proposed George as commander-in-chief, the Virginian general's future vice president and successor as U.S. president, John Adams. While whispers that Horatio should replace George as commander-in-chief occasionally manifest in conversations and letters with some congressional and military leaders even taking steps to push him out, George leads his men some 20 miles northwest of Philadelphia to make Winter's Camp. And this decision only frustrates some in Congress even more. They want George to take the supplies needed from civilians by force of bayonet. But refusing to do so, the exhausted Virginian general and his hungry, poorly dressed, ill-equipped army prepare to suffer in the cold among the more easily defendable wooded hills of Valley Forge. A ruined reputation, men moving against him, his armies battered and beaten and freezing. Feels like December 1776 all over again. Once more, things look dire for George. Thanks as always for listening. History That Doesn't Suck is a bi-weekly podcast. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just search History That Doesn't Suck. If you'd like to check out the bibliography or learn other things about the podcast, also feel free to check out the website, historythatdoesntsuck.com. And if you'd like to help the podcast keep going, consider a monthly subscription at even a buck or two. You can find me at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. And hey, if you can't give, no worries. You can still do me a solid. Please tell your friends, family, kids' soccer coach, and the grocery store clerk, or anyone else you come in contact with about the podcast. It does more than you realize. Thanks. As for next time, we'll see how this internal political fighting plays out for George and others. I'll give you one little teaser. Someone's getting shot in the mouth. Join me in two weeks from now in episode 10, where I'd like to tell you a story. (laughs) 